Welcome to Plug and Pay, a talk show where we talk with payroll professionals from all over the world about things that are changing the global payroll space. My name is Mark Oliver Fiedler. I'm the founder and CEO of Payzar. And as always, I'm joined by my esteemed co-host, Max van der Klees who's head of service delivery at Payzar. Max, great to have you on the program again. How are things with you? It's Excellent. I've had another day full of passion for global payroll, Mark. So this is the best day ever. And then tomorrow will be the next best day ever. But today we are joined by not just a guest, but by the guest, Sophia Lang, Global Payroll Process Performance Manager at SLB. Fantastic. Yes, Sophia. It's so nice to have you on the on the show today. Um, thank you for, for joining us. Um, as we always like to do, we'd like to learn a little bit about our guests and their background. So um, if I can turn the microphone over to you and um, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, good morning, uh, Marc Olivier and Max. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I am thrilled to be here with you today and uh, dive deep into the global payroll and the transformation that we're doing. So... My career started um, rather on the HR and employee support side. And about a decade ago, I got into payroll. And as one of your um, early guests said in your uh, plug and play podcast, I got into payroll by chance, but stayed by choice. Uh, so the classic story. And then um, I used to work um, for two of the biggest um, service providers on the market out there in three different countries uh, before I joined the SLB in Paris, in France, uh, where I base today. And so from running operational payroll, managing a team, um, implementations, transformations, um, I've been doing from both sides. And um, I've been leading the, the transformation at SLB now for a couple of years um, from the operational and um, um, process side. And you're still smiling, Sophia, which uh, seems like a wonderful, good transformation. <laughs> oh, it's, it's great that you're here. I know we've connected before at least uh, one time over Zoom and over LinkedIn, where we kind of follow each other. And I know you've been kind of navigating this whole big global payroll transformation. Everybody wants to go through a transformation, but you're actually doing it at the time with an organization in 100 plus countries. So can you tell the listeners a little bit around what you're doing at SLB at the uh, uh, Global Payroll Transformation? Sure. So the transformation started around 2016. Um, and then, of course, it hit a bit of a stop when COVID hit. And then we restarted the program. And then when I took over uh, this position, we kind of reshaped the whole thing and, and elevated to a program level. And as you rightfully said, Max, it's... um. um <sighs> It's overarching over more than 100 countries in the world uh, with 100,000 plus employees uh, all over. Um, and so the whole thing started with um, a problem that we had with the service provider and the whole thing just grew into something much bigger than that. And so today the vision is that we are moving towards a one payroll and one HR platform, which I know sounds a bit ambitious, but it's just uh, crazy enough to, um, to deliver, I think, the value that it has. Um, and so we should be able to do that before 2030, which is um, for- wow. Many reasons, yes, it, it it does seem a bit um a lot, but we're ambitious and we have a plan, so we need to put that plan into action, and we are doing it this year as well. We have a big big deployment that's going on, um, and I think in a nutshell, that's practically it. Mm -hmm. And so that's a that's a that's a very long term project, probably one of the longer ones that I've um heard of basically starting 2016 if I understood you correctly going all the way through now with some hiatus um, in between with with COVID but going into 2030 um, which means you really got to have your north star set and know where you're trying to go probably with a little bit of course correction in between but I'm curious how that translates into so this transformation that you're doing from the payroll and HR environment perspective how do you make sure that that aligns with the 
bigger picture and vision of the organization, which undoubtedly is evolving and changing um, during that that period of time as well? That's a really good question, Mark. And um, as you rightfully said, we are adapting as we go along. So um, it has evolved a lot over the couple of last years, uh, the direction as well and the how we do things. So when we revamp the whole methodology and, and, and the vision that we had at the beginning, um, and I took a step back, that was actually one of the main realization is that if we manage to align with the company's long-term vision and goal, then we would most likely have a buy-in as well um, into the whole program, right? And in our case, what worked the best is I had enormous amount of conversations and analytics and data gatherings within the company. And the company itself has been going through a major transformation inside and out. So I think we just needed to jump right on the train and, and ride a wave. And we are going through a whole ERP uh, strategy and, and changing as well. And our uh, main business focus is shifting a little bit as well. So when I managed to match the whole global transformation of payroll to the long-term vision of, of the, the company, that kind of just, that just clicked together. And in our case, what word is really to emphasize that payroll should be a business enabler, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, because paying people on time and accurately, that's the baseline. But if we have a strategic um, global payroll governance, it can actually contribute to the global success of the company. And so we kind of cracked it, how we can enable the ERP transformation and accelerate on mergers and acquisitions as well when it comes to integrating those um, in the company. So this is what worked for us. And um, it was really just to seize the moment as well and see what's going on and seeing the bigger picture. And just on that point as payroll as an enabler, I mean, sometimes we, we hear that, you know, payroll is the last to find out, right? When things are changing, a new system gets implemented or new countries get added or, or you know, whatever the, the broader business transformation might be, payroll somehow um, only finds out after the fact. Is that, has that your experience been, been different? And if so, is that just a cultural thing or did you do something from your end to make sure that your, um, more than just an afterthought and you're involved and you know have a voice in the process early enough. I'm laughing, but I could cry as well, you know, because <laughs> whole point of what, just what on what you're saying. Unfortunately, this is my experience throughout my whole journey in payroll that yes, we are the last ones to figure out something or learn about that. And so we are desperately trying to change that. And that was one of our main goal within uh, the global business services where, where payroll belongs to is that how we can balance out actually the power struggles within the company as well between IT organization and the GPS organization and, and take the ownership back um, mm -hmm. and trying to be in the driver's seat as well because payroll has um, its seat at the table, right? And it should be uh, when it comes to all strategic decisions. And... Um, I think this is one of maybe the biggest wins lately is that we kind of managed to claim that place back and show to the organization of the benefits of having payroll at the table when it comes to strategic organizational decisions. What are the benefits um, and the major benefits to that? And and I'm not saying it's a done deal. I think it's an ongoing um uh, battle, uh, if I dare say, on a global level, but on a country level as well. My experience was the same when running French payroll or, yeah. or leading the team is that an ongoing battle with HR and finance and everything is like, you sign something, just let us know because we can help and we can make sure that it is put in place on time and you engaged um, on something and we can deliver. Um, I, I'm i afraid we have to say that it is not something cultural, but it is, it is something um, um, normal, unfortunately within the payroll world. Yeah. Yeah, I also have the scars of that, Sophia, that you were the last to hear and then find out that there is a new benefit policy. But I think there, there are ways to get there, right? To be uh, a front and center. And for me, 
you know, this debate about should payroll report to kind of HR and finance and a seat at the table that might be a little bit linked to the topic I think you, you raised, Mark. It, for me, it's irrelevant, which might be a bit of a controversial theme, but I think mm -hmm. what we should focus on is to increase the visibility of payroll's role and not so much, you know, saying, oh, we need to be involved here, we need to be involved there. HR traditionally maybe not so data driven, but it's becoming much more data driven, right? At least that's the ambition. Um, and, and finance has always been data driven. So I think we need to increase our visibility. And with that, we will most likely be included in, you know, whatever new transformation or just, you know, M&A activity, as you mentioned, Sophia, which is we really should be involved on time. Otherwise that, that you know, those new, new people won't have a great onboarding experience or just a new benefit. So I do think, you know, the visibility is key. And we're trying to do that through these conversations, actually, with you, Sophia. That's how we at PESA try to contribute there. But maybe bringing it back to your, your transformation, 2030 is still, from my experience, at a large oil or energy company, always screams SAP. 2030 means SAP, Sophia. Am I right? I didn't want to say, but once you said it out loud, yes, that's the obvious reason that we yeah. need to finish the... Um, the deployment and the transformation before that uh, date. And we still need to migrate then to a newer version um, yeah. of SAP. So there's extremely amount of work on uh, on the table. Um, so we needed to roll up the sleeves and, and dig right yeah, in. Exactly. It re reminds me of the strategy that actually also started in 2016, 2017, the first iteration and then uh, also had an end in 2030. So I guess a lot of people are in similar situations as as you are and I was. So maybe, uh, Sophia, I'm just putting it out there. People can connect with Sophia on any perfect advice you might want. So Sophia, you'll be reached out to a lot now, which is awesome. But it also reminds me of a rollout strategy, especially with the longer term that you're looking into, you know, maybe customized platforms really embedded in all the different functions. So just want to get your opinion about a rollout strategy in a multi-year journey that you're in. And there's kind of two different ways that I've used them both, uh, like a waterfall approach where you would kind of do wave by wave by wave, or maybe more agile and, you know, with sprints. How would you want to describe your rollout strategy, in your payroll uh, transformations? For you? So um, we have tried both also. Okay. And I know that the, the textbook definition says that a payroll deployment should be 100% waterfall. But based on my experience, um, I think success lies when we combine the two. Hmm. And, and I think the best strategy is start with waterfall when it comes to your requirement gatherings and your design phase and so on, so on. Then shift into agile because I think you should fail fast and then adjust, recover fast, and then you will um, get to the perfect product. And then naturally at the end of the phase of the deployment, we switch back to waterfall uh, when we're coming closer to the, the production goal life. So to be honest with you, we are still perfecting that methodology, but today um, what we are doing is really a mixture of two. And, and I think that that um, the key is, is, is there. So, so um, that's interesting to hear that you kind of tried both and learned a bit about, you know, what what are the benefits and maybe also the the challenges of one versus the others, and found sort of uh, you know working with those in a in a blend is maybe the the right right path for you. And just building on that, I suppose I'm curious, uh, Sophia, in general, um, as as a a global process owner and leading such a big transformation. Um, are there any specific challenges, struggles, um, big aha experiences that you've come across along the way in terms of, you know, um, seeing what works, what doesn't work, anything that you can share with other people out there that are either in the middle of it, or maybe, you know, think about embarking onto a similar, similar journey. What are some of the the do's and don'ts that you've taken away from from this experience that you're still very much in the middle of, but what you've seen and learned um, uh, along the way so far? Well, if you're asking for the cheat sheets, 
that <laughs> I would have loved to have that it most probably would like. Let's start with the dons. And yeah. never ever underestimate the complexity of any payroll. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the complexity and the software, but the processes and the people behind. Mm -hmm. I feel like they, they those guys a bit um, uh, on the background. Um, don't underestimate the cultural differences either, because I think we need to approach different parts of the world a, a slightly bit differently. Never do full agile <laughs> on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> been there done that learn from others mistakes if you will and there's one thing that I would have loved to know is that someone telling me that the journey can get really lonely at some point right but you should never give up so you should just stick to the plan and if you have a vision and 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 you're 100% sure that it's working is the right way to go because it brings the value to the organization that you just have to stick to that and and continue and um and just be perseverant so those are the don'ts and the do's um always do your due diligence and i'm not just talking about um of course mapping out what's going on so the as is or where we're standing and why we're doing that and where we're going but go to the market, look around what's going on, the new trends, the softwares, the payroll providers, and go and talk to your peers out there because I think that we have such a wonderful community who's willing to share and willing to advise, which is a rare uh, thing, I think, um, uh, to find. And I'm sure that whatever you're dealing with today, someone has confronted already that problematics or have gone through of the same. And based on my experience, they are more than happy to share or guide you. And um, I'm lucky enough to be part of several of these kinds of um, community of experts. And I always find some kind of answers or just a, a little word of encouragement out there, which sometimes uh, is more than necessary. The second thing is that work on your strategic partnerships within a company, having your allies um, and fighting the battle together I think that just um, wins the game at the end of the uh, at the end of the day. And um, the other thing we have talked about it, if you can align with the company strategy, is just um, I think guarantees that that you have the buy-in. Another thing that I would mention is that, uh, and I think I'm working on that constantly as well, is your communication, right? you will end up having to talk to people on the ground running operational payroll to maybe your CFO and, and CIO. You need to be able to adapt your language and add or remove the payroll jargon because not everyone is the same yeah. of understanding right and complexity. So I find that extremely helpful and difficult at times when something makes just perfect sense in my head, but I just can't translate it right so that my audience understands the same way that I see things and maybe a bit of an inside joke with one of uh, my colleagues that we're having is that ask five times this is always uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> because first time we always get a no based on my experience um, when it comes to payroll and transformation and bigger investments and so on so on so it I think it just comes back to the fact that um, you should just be perseverant and have a clear vision and a mission and and just own that and just go out there and ask five times you might just get a yes at the end yeah this uh, great nuggets of you this brings me back to the lean trainings i did because i think it is <laughs> a, a method to get to the root cause right the five uh, w questions yeah and speaking of communication that can become very kind of oh uh, disturbing for people like you ask why you give an answer then again, it almost feels like talking to kids, right? They, I was they, going to say that's like yeah. a nine-year-old. He he has no inhibition to ask the same thing five times. He yeah. definitely has the perseverance when it's something that he wants. Yeah, it's it's like the, I think my my son asked this morning, "Can I get chocolate on my sandwich?" I said, "Like no, why?" So, well, <laughs> it's not a great way to start the day. Why? Well, it's a bit unhealthy. Why? There's a lot of sugar in it. Why? Yeah, because then it tastes nice. Why? Okay, enough. You gotta get a cheese sandwich and some milk because you're a Dutch guy. So a cheese sandwich and some milk. Anyway, I do love the analogy. And, and I think getting lonely, Sophia, is something I also 
recognized from when I did the, the strategy rules, right? You could feel like you're sitting in an ivory tower somewhere in HQ, right? Yeah. Have great slide packs and then like, where's my allies? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's a great point. And maybe um, can you give some tips to people who feel lonely in a sense and then want to go out to networks that you're maybe part of, that I'm part of? What kind of piece of personal advice would you be there for people who now listen to it and are like, oh, I feel lonely too, but I want to be in one of those networks. Like, wh where do you find them? Where do you go? How did you find them? Well, um, good question. They can reach out to one of us, for example, so that we can give tips and tricks. Um, but I was just spreading the word and, and being really open and honest about it, that I would like to join these kind of communities because I'm looking for a bit more um, inspiration and a bit more uh, like-minded people to exchange because um, in a large organization that I work in, uh, there are not a lot of people who have the similar job. I have the only one, right? right. Um, so it is hard um, and it can get really lonely. Um, which is not because you always have um, your supporters and, and your uh, teamwork and like the, the colleagues and, and your team and maybe your, your um, supervisors, but um, it's just really a different level when you can exchange on the topic with someone who are going through the same thing. So yeah. um, uh, LinkedIn is a great source as well when you just start connecting with people and spreading the word. And, and I think naturally it will come um, all those possibilities um, that just opens up that, hey, I'm part of this organization. Do you want to join? And 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 so on, so on. It, it was really natural for me by being open and, and um, looking for the opportunity actually um, actively. Always nicer to find other, you know, yeah. um, similar, similar folks in similar situations to yeah. compare notes and, you know, re re-encourage each other and, um, you know, see how you can help each other along the, the way. I think that's the, that's the nice thing about working in payroll. It never feels like um, people are somehow competing or trying to outsmart each uh, other. I think everyone's 100%. trying to, we all recognize that it's a very challenging, complex environment. Um, and, you know, back to the point earlier about payroll being the last to find out. And um, I think as much as we can all pull together to uh, elevate the, the profile and you know um elevate the the uh the the performance and the success of the function um it helps helps all of us helps the entire industry um one one of the things i wanted to ask you uh sophia is um given the transformation experience that, that you've had um over the years one of the things that we find with um especially international organizations is is always um, this challenge of finding the right balance between standardizing. Everyone wants to ideally standardize, you know, things um, across the organization. That's why you know organizations implement things like um, shared service structures or global business um, service um, concepts. But then, on the other hand, we know that payroll at the end of the day is. We always like to say hyper local, right? Uh, you need to you need to really understand the local um, rules and regulations, specific context, and and so on, um, and that requires flexibility and and so on. Um, so how do you how do you manage that kind of dichotomy between standardization and 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 at the same time flexibility to adapt to local requirements? Well, Mark, it is the eternal question now, isn't it? Yes. Well, I'm asking, do you, have, have you found some enlightenment or any tips <laughs> or tricks along the way? Yeah. So what has been working for us, um, and it's not 100% perfect, don't get the, the wrong idea, is that um, we put in place um, a new organizational structure and bring all the process owners together uh, with... Um, a very strict governance in place. Um, we have figured out what are the metrics that we want to see. So we have all the decisions and, and uh, um, the direction backed up with data and so on, so on. Now, I think, and we were not far from that, is that usually um, multinational organizations start off 
of the 20% harmonize and 80% uh, uh, localize or, or, or flexibility, right? And I kind of think that we need to reverse that and we need to move mm -hmm. towards of having 80% uh, standardized and have that layer of flexibility and, and localization. Because as you said, it is just the nature of payroll. We would never uh, achieve like 100% harmonization um, level either. Um, it is a lot of uh, negotiations and, and bringing people on board, but but having that structure in place within uh, the global business services, it, it did help us because we kind of centralized all that. And when you have a lot of chefs in the kitchen, you never get to the right results, right? Um, in all the Michelin star restaurants as well, you only have one head chef. And then <laughs> that is that is proven to be a right formula for us. Uh, and so this is my role actually in, in the organization as well of driving from the process point of view, this standardization um, and harmonization. But um, you always have that one and two and five uh, special cases and the local regulations and so on that you need to cater for. There's no debate about that. Yeah, it's, it's it, it resonates as well, Sophia, like uh, this big push for standardization. Uh, you know, I think you're also operating uh, GBSs or, or service centers, right? Global business services in, in certain locations, which kind of centralizes core activities traditionally, but I think now also includes like really value add uh, uh, processes, uh, uh, business partners, right? It's not just a transactional hub anymore. It's, I think, grown into a lot more. And then the, originally the transactional sites, right, uh, required a lot of standardization. What mm. if you bring 50 countries into one central hub in a certain place, right? Wow. Now suddenly you bring all of this local payroll complexity, cultural nuances you you, you mentioned into one place and you want it to be, you know, still be 100% accurate, compliant, which drives the need for standardization. But then there is still a local amount of flexibility that either the business demands a certain culture demands, okay, and, and you've shared to have a kind of organizational structure in place, something that I had a previous company, like a process owner council. So mm -hmm. how, how you kind of deal with the, the local requests for being different and flexible to a kind of a governance yeah. structure that, that evaluates that? Exactly. And, and if you ask me from an operational model point of view, I think for payroll, what works the best if we think about these shared service centers or hubs uh, is that just because of the nature of payroll, I don't believe that you could uh, operate from one and single location when it comes to uh, multinational organizations. I have seen that in the past, many yeah. have tried, I think many have failed. I think the best formula for that is to have at least one on each um, uh, hemispheres or continent rather uh, that has you know this very specific knowledge as well because cultural differences and language barriers they're a, a big mm -hmm. thing not even talking about the, the knowledge and the skill set that you need to have and it goes way beyond just a, a software knowledge or how I can uh, just run through my payroll but all the granularity the nitty and gritty of of payroll you need to know the local rules uh, in order to be, be successful. So I think, again, the formula is really to have local hubs um, to operate that, that could cater for standardization or like just yeah, harmonization, but still um, have that additional layer that caters for, for flexibility. So I'm just curious in practice, Sophia, does that mean things like, for example, um, choice of the local payroll vendor, let's say, right? Uh, which can be obviously very specific to mm -hmm. the country environment that you're in, who's the best expert at supporting you uh, in, in that uh, specific jurisdiction. Is that something that um, you give the flexibility and choice to the local countries to decide, hey, in our case, you know, in this country, you want to work with this vendor, uh, but then sort of how you work with the vendor or how you govern the relationship or what the scope of service are and the expectations and terms that you set out on the, on those screens. That's something where you enforce some um, regional, at least as you described it, right? Maybe it's not mm -hmm. at the global level, but maybe there's regional hubs that set certain, um, you know, frameworks that everyone needs to work under. Is that 
Is that how how it would work, or or would the choice of vendor already be hmm, that's strategic enough, and there's you know implications on other parts of that network as well that that's not something that is left to the to the countries. I see you smile. So there's probably a depends <laughs> answer coming. Yeah. yeah. So what you have just described, it's exactly how we used to operate, right? That the, the countries and the regions have their own choices. So we ended up having several dozens of mm -hmm. providers all around the place. And honestly, it at some point, I think it just becomes unmanageable. And mm -hmm. it's such an additional workload of vendor uh, management and relationship and service level agreements and, and so on and right. so on. So part of my vision is to change that as well and reduce the number as much as possible. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you will have to go to very local service providers, but I think that we need to handle that as well from a global level, or at least this is my approach, um, because if you don't do that, then you will not be able to standardize nor the processes, nor um, uh, the software that you're using, um, or even you know the skill set, the knowledge that you maybe want to um, level up. So we're trying to derive from that and really handle that from a global point of view. Of course, having the local expertise and the, the, the stakeholders around the table when it comes down to the decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it could be then something where the the, the central or regional hub team says, look, you can have, you know, work A if it's up to whatever, three or four or five vendors. And, you know, you have some flexibility to choose which ones those are, but it's not going to be 25 vendors, right? You set some sort of expectations and, um, and, and um, directions from, from that perspective. I think it goes even beyond that okay. because we, we had a previous conversation with Max and we just started a conversation about this long tail, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. um, when it comes to the biggest countries and the biggest headcount, it's not much of a headache, honestly, and we can run it from um, in-house as well. But when mm -hmm. it comes to the small headcounts and the very weird countries right. around the world, right, where we operate and a lot of companies operate in, yeah. um, it, it is a true headache would you do with that because let's be honest it just doesn't worth putting the investment in and bringing them on a global platform uh, sure. with 100 percent integration and so on so on um, another way to go mark is to say that i'm contracting um, an outsourced provider on the market and they can subcontract and they can deal with the very local specificities and then i just want uh, the data and the end result back in my system which is kind of the way that i see things and and that would be part of the the one payroll system is that a bunch of countries which is less than a certain uh, amount of headcount would be most probably outsourced and then um that would need to be even subcontracted for the very local um providers to to run to my net um, yep. calculation and then after that feeding back the the results to our global um, mm -hmm. machine so that yeah. we can leverage later on you know global reporting and banking and so on so on i hear there are some very cool global solutions out there i won't name any names now but uh, that allow you to do that um you could work with you know so i've heard as well <laughs> different different vendors um throughout the regions and still get it all consolidated up into uh, one one central environment. Very exciting. All right. Um, good. Well, I think I think we we covered a lot um, and got some really good insights. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to see is there any other things that you want to leave the the listeners with um, in terms of insights you've learned or you know shout outs um that people should be aware of maybe some some key takeaways well and, and what worked because i got asked a lot like how did it work how did you get to the point where you are in the transformation journeys then i always say that payroll is a necessary evil in a company <laughs> right like it has to be there everyone knows that there's no doubt about it but no one right. wants to detach it or change it or even put money on that so it is a hard sell to be honest with you yeah. and what worked out in our case as well is that um um we monetize all the the 
the return on investment or the value that it could bring. Return on investment is hard to um, calculate, I think, because it's not a quick uh, return and it's not a dollar to dollar um, a value, right? So what we ended up doing is that we tried to put on paper everything that we could even avoid, like cost mm. avoid and, and even the non-productive time and monetize it. And, and when we started really adding up all the layers, because it is really multifaceted, then we really ended up uh, with a huge bill that we could present. And, and it really um, worked out well in, in our case. Um, that, that's, that's interesting. So sorry, yeah. just to jump in there because she said um, it's it's clear that it's hard to do kind of a quick, um, you know, sort of quick return. Mm -hmm. um, you got to plan this for a longer, you know, sort of a long term. Um, but then also you said it's hard to show sort of dollar for dollar. Um, but it sounds like you still managed to somehow show the monetized aspects of it. Is that is that? Is that right? So you did some yes. able to total up all the time savings or quality improvements into dollars. Yes, I can, yeah, I can maybe give you a couple of examples. Um, of course, we can talk about total cost of ownership, uh, license fees, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. But on the other hand, when it comes really, because those are savings, hard savings, right? But when it comes to avoiding cost, it can be really to avoid the cost of upgrading an already obsolete platform. Mm -hmm. um, avoiding of the need to rebuild an interface that we won't need in the future if we move um, a bit quicker with the transformation. Um, or when it comes to integrating um, another company, when it comes to joint venture, uh, it is a lot of savings that we can do if we bring that on early on because we have a harmonized and central one HR and one uh, payroll platform. So all that put together plus the revamped methodology that we had uh, touched based on is that how you can speed up and by changing the methodology and having the right um, team in place, how much you can save by by speeding up because every single month spending deployment and a transformation um, is, is an astronomical amount of, of, of money. So that is... Um, that is something that really worth, I think, looking at. Um, and then it goes way beyond that, which is really hard to monetize off of when it comes to um, employee engagement and retaining your, um, even mm -hmm. your people, or even goes yep. beyond that because payroll has a rippling effect on our people in the organization, right? Yeah. So um, that's, I, I think we need to take a step back and, and look at it holistically and, yeah. and cover all the grounds. It, it really worked out well for us. I like that. I like that. Um, I mean, we, we, I'm personally very curious about the business case topic mm -hmm. um, and the RI, uh, because I think that's one of the, one of the areas that we, you know, us as a solution provider, we always encounter at some point in the discussion. Yeah. Right? It can be a lot of excitement about, wow, this, um, I can really see how this is going to help make our lives easier. Of course. But then, Translating that for the rest of the organization, for the decision makers into well, what does that really mean? Making payroll mm -hmm. professionals life easier um, can sometimes be not that trivial. And I love the fact that you took this very broad view of not just the, you know, the, the hard dollar savings, but there's things like employee retention and employee satisfaction that are maybe more indirect effects but those can be some of the most important ones right i remember uh from one of your posts sophia that you also shared um kind of two takeaways which are kind of close to my heart one is dare to be ambitious and bold and the other one is play is highly underrated in a professional environment this speaks to me like you need to be bold to make a move and to be seen making a move and making a decision go out there don't be afraid to be seen and the other one is also remember to have fun is, is that a right interpretation of those statements you made Sophia um 100 percent and I can elaborate on that a bit so when I say there to be bold and ambitious it's um really speaking from experience because if your vision and transformation uh plan has not been called at least once crazy, then are you even doing the right thing? I I think that you need to take a calculated risk. 
you need to uh, do your due diligence and and um, plan out all the risks. But then at some point where the real value lies, it's when we step out of our comfort zone and, and we dare to to innovate a bit and have a bit of some outside of the box thinking. I know it's very in today, but payroll, I think it's very overlooked and put aside, right? Um, a profession yeah, yeah. where it, boldness or, or ambition doesn't always come to mind, right? And when we, as Mark, you said, when we can present that throughout um, um, a business case, I think it just gets a bit more attention and and you can move a, like a head bit easier and, and have that buy-in. So um, yeah, I, I got that. And on the play part, this is something very close to my heart. And I have a firsthand experience on that on and off work. Actually, that's why it, it, it speaks to me. And I always take the opportunity and, and did it in the past as well, either within my team or when I animate a workshop or conference and so on, so on. Because um, I read that in the article that I think it's spot on is that teams that play together stay together. Uh -huh. And it's so true because... Um, when we manage to have little breaks and 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 playful moments in the professional environment, it just really fosters you know collaboration, communication within the team, and and reinforces trust. And those are the basic elements, right, of teamwork. And we need to work in a team to to move forward. No one can can do this uh, big transformation journeys or any kind of job practically alone. So that is something that I I really stand by, mm. and. Also, it has an, another effect that is really close to my heart as well. Um, and again, a lot of studies have shown, right, that your creativity will spike when, uh, not when you're sitting in two hours, three hours team meetings, but when you're <laughs> when you're outside and playing and in nature and sunlight exposure or taking a shower, listening to your favorite music. So it is something that stimulates creativity and 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 boosts the productivity. So why don't we, you know, just use that more widely uh, to get where we are? It's it's so important. We live in a in a world where I think the boundaries are really blurred between the professional and the personal life, right? The traditional 40 hours work week, it's just transformed so much where we end up checking our emails at late at night or on, on holidays. And it is just like a constant stress in our life. Yeah. And if play and a little bit of rest can can just help to reduce the, the probability or the chance of mental illnesses or ultimately burnout, then I think all companies should just foster that company culture that celebrates that so that's just my personal take on that well i think that's wonderful sophia <laughs> let's have fun and sometimes even make a joke and laugh or yes. be away from the screen without the fear of missing out so it's been amazing to have you sophia i think we uh, are gonna wrap it up but thanks for the valuable insights and the experiences i think you've been an excellent guest so thanks a lot um, for joining it's great, you. great place to end on as well on that yeah. sort of you know personal play yeah. play hard work hard play hard note. Um, yeah, so Sophia, thank you so much for for joining us for today's episode. For for everyone who's out there who enjoyed this content, please make sure to follow us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, and subscribe and like our content so we can share that with a broader uh, community out there as well. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much everyone day. for dialing in and uh, keep optimizing, keep innovating and keep spreading that payroll passion. Thanks everyone. Thanks Sophia. Bye.